Hello, everyone, and welcome to A Day in the Life, where I catch up with people on work, life, and anything else. Today's guest is Paul Rice, and Paul is a speech pathologist, and we both went to Presbyterian College in Clinton, South Carolina. So we've known each other for years now. We were in band together all four years of college and bonded over movies, literature, and pop culture. Movie nights at Paul's were a staple of my college experience. I was in Paul's wedding as a groomsmaid, and we've kept in touch lately by playing games on Board Game Arena and chess.com. But Paul's chess skills are way better than mine. He's beating me every time. <laughs> Got to keep practicing. Um, so Paul also, he worked at a newspaper for a few years before deciding to become a speech pathologist, which is what he does now. So the first kind of segment, we're going to talk about work, and then we'll get into some details about your life. So Paul, let's start off with your job in speech pathology. How would you explain it to someone who's not at all familiar with the field? Uh, so I work in um, pediatric speech pathology. So that's working with uh, kids mainly in the school system on their uh, speech, which is think about all the different sounds that we make in the English language. Um, a lot of these kids are not making those sounds or not making them correctly for whatever reason. So we're working to rehabilitate that. We're also working on uh, language, which can be different things like grammar on the more advanced side of things, but also uh, can be just uh, using either you know, vocal means or visual means to so like signing or picture boards, that kind of thing, just to communicate on the language side. And that can go um, where I'm working now, we can work really from like that birth to three population, early intervention, but also uh, school age as well. So oh, cool. a lot of it is, yeah, therapeutic techniques, uh, play-based therapy, that kind of thing to work on those specific goals. Yeah, I was wondering about if you involved play and in games in that. That's I mean, right. with kids, I feel like you've got to. Yeah, yeah. The, the thing I heard a lot about in grad school is that, you know, like as adults, think about, we think about, we learn through work and lectures, that kind of thing. There's a very like formal way that we learn typically. Mm -hmm. But for kids, you know, work is play essentially. And that's, yeah. that's how they learn. That's how they pick things up. And that's how they experience a lot of life too. So yeah, I, the first thing, you know, I want to make sure there's a good balance of play-based therapy, but also that our specific goals that we're working on in each session that we have. Yeah, that sounds really fun. I, I've kind of realized yeah. lately that I, I haven't been working with kids as much as I used to when I was a kid, when I was in high school, I used to babysit a lot. And even in college, yeah. I babysat and then grad school. And now I work, I just with adults all the time, I kind of miss hanging around kids more. They're a lot of fun. Yeah, it's it's a really fun environment. And I mean, I, we've laughed a lot about it a lot because I feel like um, during uh, quarantine as well, when, you know, Mary Ellis was working from home, a lot of people we knew from working from home, I wasn't seeing that many people, but I was seeing like 15 or 20 kids a day. <laughs> that was my main <laughs> social <you> interaction. <laughs> so who knows, we're out the other side now, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it makes for a really fun, uh, different kind of day. Yeah. So how did you decide to get into speech pathology anyway? You were working at the newspaper and then you got interested in this. Yeah, it, it is kind of an unusual journey because I feel like a lot of people, um, you, know, like new, you know, what does a newspaper have to do with that? And I, mm -hmm. I don't know. In my mind, there's a link between communication there. Yeah, well. it is. It's it's kind of far out. Um, <laughs> I mainly, you know, I started the newspaper and I, I knew, you know, from the start that it probably wasn't going to be what I wanted to do long term. And I wanted to get exposed to lots of different things, kind of figure out what I wanted to do from there. And that's more or less what happened. We started um, working with uh, like a year on a year long project at the newspaper. Um, and this was specifically about um, neonatal abstinence syndrome. So um, kids who are born dependent on opioids typically um, in our region, but it can really be um, just about any substance. Anyway, um, as it turns out, we were interviewing a lot of speech therapists who work in the NICUs um, to rehabilitate things like a swallowing function, feeding, that kind of thing, which can get disrupted um, for some different reasons uh, because of the substance exposure. So long, you know, that kind of brought me back to, oh yeah, speech pathology, which I had heard through some like linguistics courses and that kind of thing back in college. And for whatever reason, it hadn't clicked with me. Um, but uh, talking with these people and talking with um, other people in the field, I thought, well, actually, this, this seems kind of awesome. Um, 
So I started doing a lot of shadowing and things like that. And I really, um, although started off looking at the NICU side of things, which is a really specialized branch of speech pathology. There's lots of different applications, <laughs> uh, lots of different facilities you can work in. Um, but I, I kind of found myself gravitating towards uh, pediatric speech therapy outside like a medical setting, uh, schools, private practice, that kind of thing. And that's where I found myself after a couple of years of school and a lot of uh, like clinical internships, that kind of thing. That's really cool. I don't think I ever quite knew that. I just knew you were making that change. Um, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. And what were you doing at the newspaper specifically? <laughs> yeah, I started there um, working as a, oh, let me see if I can get this right. I was a copy editor slash um, page designer. Mm -hmm. So it was editing all of the copy that went in the newspaper on a daily basis. And then also designing anywhere between uh, four to 10 newspaper pages like graphic design um, in, a, in a night. And so that was, that was cool. I did that for a year, um, worked with a really good team there. And then a year in, I switched over, there became a vacancy and I worked um, as the digital content coordinator. So basically uh, managing the, the newspaper's main website. So the way anyone would read the paper digitally and then also all the different social media platforms and a lot of our like local um, social media strategies and things like that. And that was really, really interesting. I learned a lot. And that's the, the cool thing about working at the newspaper is I feel like I did really learn a lot of stuff. I'm getting exposed to lots of things. Um, so it's a good time. And after, I think I, I was in that job for two years total, but in the second year, I was also taking some classes um, at nights for prerequisites to the grad program for speech therapy as well. Oh, so yeah. That so all in the timeline. What kind of prerequisites did you need for that? Um, let's see. There were, I think, six courses that were specific to speech pathology. And so those are courses on things like um, phonetics, which is, you know, think about like the international phonetic um, alphabet, um, things like that from a clinical point of view. Um, there were a lot of courses on the anatomy and physiology of both speech and hearing. So all the, you know, um, oral mechanisms, respiratory, your ears, of course, a lot of neurology is involved with that too, since we're working with language. So a lot of that got covered. And those are a lot of fun courses. Um, and yet like things like typical language development too. So um, that gets covered. I feel like a lot of, a lot of this stuff kind of gets covered in more and more advanced um, depth as you kind of go through um, from the undergraduate to the graduate onto the clinical work. Um, just so you have a really strong uh, framework for working with all the different things. You understand where different milestones are and things like that. So a lot of it's laying the, the groundwork for that at the undergrad level. Yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't think about needing to know all the like anatomy and like science behind it. Yeah, <laughs> it, cool. yeah. Is I, I, you know, I, I got a, a BA mm -hmm. as well um, at PC and uh, I didn't, at the time necessarily picture myself getting an MS, but that is, that is what happened. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, I guess I technically have one too, but it's more technology yep. oriented than, than science-y, but that's, that's pretty cool. Um, do, you, do you feel like um, you took, like did your science classes at college help you at all? Yeah, definitely. I took, um, the main science courses I took were biology, which was, mm -hmm. yep, that was a good move. Um, and physics, which actually is a great one too. There's a lot of, um, one of the grad courses I took was on just voice specifically, which is very um, based in like um, physics as well. Thinking about like the amplitude of the waves that we're producing. There's a lot of equipment that's used to measure voice and mm -hmm. vocal work on that. Again, another niche of yeah. speech pathology is working specifically with vocalists huh. or professional voice users, um, singers, pastors, you know, speakers, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah um, like public speaking, like training, mm -hmm. training their voice to be more, I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot of things that happen like specifically with your vocal folds and oh, I turn this off. Um, a lot of things that happen specifically with your vocal folds and your larynx, um, pathologically speaking, especially for people who use their voice 
um, heavily throughout the day, um, mm -hmm. especially if teachers uh, would be would be a pretty common uh, profession for us to work with. Um, just because there's uh, there's a lot of use happening there, and when that happens, it can aggravate or exacerbate some you know, some issues there with uh, with the vocal folds. So anyway, uh, physics is very helpful <laughs> on that side of things um, because there is a lot of um, measurement and, and understanding of what's going on there that's that's based in in that particular branch, as well as the the anatomy and physiology. Wow. So my brother has a very confident and loud. I don't know if that's the best way to say it, like just kind of very commanding kind of voice. And I, everybody has a hard time hearing me. And so I'm just like, that's so interesting. I guess it's related to our, our vocal cords and other things you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. I know I'm the same way. Some people just have a much um, more resonant uh, mm. vocal tract and manner of speaking. I, I'm kind of the same way as you though. I, I need to speak up a few times in, in some situations to be heard. Um, and that some of that's a learned thing too, but mm. yeah. Yeah. I was wondering, are there, can I, can I train myself to have a more commanding voice <laughs> <laughs> that, okay. Yeah. So that's the, that's the speech therapist to me is going to say, you can train your voice to do anything <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> within, within reason, uh -huh. but yeah, huh. uh, we're all, you know, we all have, uh, you know, trainable, uh, vocal tracks to a certain extent. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Think about that if I if I want to do that, but I definitely know that like I sometimes I just talk way too quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Uh, so um, I guess I gotta ask, what's a day in the life like for you? Um, it can be it can be a little different depending on what time of year it is. Hmm. Like I said, I I am typically in the schools, but. During the summertime, I work um, in a private practice clinic, actually. Same, same company and all that. We just happen to have a clinic um, nearby that I work out of. So it would look a little bit different based on that. But typically, um, I'll go with the school schedule because we're, we're gearing back up for school again right now. Um, so I would get up around you know, 6 or so in the morning um, and leave, the ho leave home around 7, get to the school around uh, 7.30, 7.45. Um, and start to get uh, prepped. Uh, it's I've worked you, you know, as a speech therapist. Um, I should say specifically, I work at a private practice as a contractor, um, or, or rather, the private practice contracts with different school districts to provide speech therapy services. Um, so we are kind of covering a lot of the surplus caseload that the uh, the school system has in order to uh, make life easier on um, the school employed speech therapists at no cost to the school system. So a lot of this is covered by the state's um, insurance company. Um, that's the nuts and bolts of it. But what it means is, is that I don't have like a set aside typically like classroom of my own or anything mm -hmm. since I'm not employee of the school. So I practice in all kinds of locations. Um, I've practiced at this one school that I'm going to be at out of a library, but also tables in the hallway, things like that. Um, so I get set up, like I said before, eight. When students start coming in, I have a lot of back-to-back -back, uh, sessions for 20 minutes at a time in the school system. And that can continue ideally throughout the school day as I'm seeing uh, clients. And so, uh, like I said, I, I kind of th think about, there's lots of different types of clients, but I could typically have uh, be working on speech goals or language goals. Mm -hmm. So if I'm working on speech, that's things like uh, what a lot of people think of when they think of a speech therapist. So working on like R and S sounds and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, I like to do a lot of repetition of those sounds. Um, maybe there's some drilling involved, but a lot of it uh, to make it fun involves different board games or activities, um, things that are going to be fun for them. If they have to think too much about the fact that they're working, it's not going to be too enjoyable yeah. <laughs> for anyone. Um, so that's what that looks like. Like I said, heavy repetition, um, making sure that we're thinking about producing those sounds um, a lot of times in relation to sounds that are similar and thinking about, um, I like to emphasize like what people are specifically doing with their, their teeth, their lips, their tongue, things like that in order to make those sounds. And I typically have like a mirror near me as well so they can 
visualize what mm. they're doing. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. A lot of people, I'm a visual thinker and yeah. it's just one more, one more tool there. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm working with language, um, typically in the schools, I'm either working with uh, pre-K kids for that, for those, um, for those goals. And that's a lot of like uh, basic communication almost. And it can be verbal, but could also be nonverbal. Um, but in either case, I'm working with, you know, some age appropriate toys, blocks, piggy banks, um, Mr. Potato Head, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, and we can work on things like, you know, what are the different colors we're working with? What are the different pieces? What would you like to do? Um, just making a request is a, is a big deal for a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that is about providing communication temptations or things that they enjoy doing uh -huh. and leveraging that interest and that engagement with the need to communicate. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it gets, you know, involves early on getting to know the kid, um, knowing what they like, what they want to do, what motivates them mm -hmm. and uh, working within that to uh, I guess orchestrate um, interactions that are going to be most likely to generate reasons to communicate. <laughs> that makes yeah. sense. Um, because you know, for a lot of kids, you you could be perfectly happy and never say anything. So you know, everyone needs a reason to communicate. Yeah. And um, a lot of it has to do with with um, making that possible. Um, so yeah, that continues generally throughout the uh, throughout the school day. Um, I typically I uh, have a main caseload at one school, and then I have sort of a secondary caseload at another school. Fill in there. And then the afternoons, I might have, um, I might be working with some younger kids, like birth to three. They haven't reached that pre-K um, or that state run, like Head Start pre-K in the school's uh, age level yet. But they are, um, they do have services coordinated um, through the state's early intervention system. So I see a lot of those clients as well in the afternoons after school in different daycares or other places. And uh, we're working on the like, similar language goals there, but it's at an earlier age and things are probably not going to be as advanced at that level because they haven't aged into that yet. And so, yeah, that's a lot of that. Um, and then I take time at the end of the day to write up notes for all that and do billing and that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, drive home around four o'clock every day. Wow. You do a lot in a day, a lot of different <laughs> things too. It, it's never, it's hardly ever the same day twice. Uh, <laughs> um, and it's very, you know, it's very common, especially uh, this last year with all the, all the school changes, um, things like that. It was very common for the schedule to change up on a weekly basis. That was pretty mm. typical. So hopefully it, this year, it will be a little bit more consistency, maybe month to month. Yeah. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, I can see like it being nice to have things be different, but if it's too much, too much going on that's different, that can be a little, little overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a right balance in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, totally. So, um, well, let's change gears and talk about just life and fun stuff. Like, yeah. so I've been really curious. I know I remember hearing that you made a board game. So, um, <laughs> I, yeah, I should have brought that up here that. with me. Oh, yeah. Oops. <laughs> uh, it has pieces and everything. Um, but anyway, I it started, I read a um, a biography uh, last, like fall of 2019. It was a biography called Titan by Ron Chernow. Um, same guy who wrote Hamilton. I was like, wait, um, I know that name. <laughs> yep. Just right there. <laughs> um, oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great biographer. <laughs> Love him. Um, and it's about, Titan is about, um, oh, uh, Rockefeller, mm. um, so the oil tycoon in the, uh, oh gosh, he lived to be like 99, so wow. <laughs> 1840 to 1940, I want to say, so wow. that's his <laughs> life, yeah, really, really interesting guy, and I highly recommend that, um, I mean, very controversial guy too, but I highly recommend the book, it's super well written. And I don't know, I was reading that book and I had an idea for like a resources based like Euro style board game. So mm -hmm. I, I wrote it to myself, but I was in the middle of grad school and mm -hmm. it was like the last year, a lot of clinical stuff happening. I was writing a thesis at the time and uh, yeah, maybe, maybe when I have like huge chunks of time, mm -hmm. <laughs> I might get to this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, fast forward, um, uh, there was, there was about a month, month and a half where 
I had graduated from grad school and I was waiting to start working um, for psychic therapy where I still, I still work. Um, and I didn't have a lot going on and most everything was in lockdown anyway. Yeah. So I thought, well, now's a great time to get into, right. you know, all the different hobbies. So mm -hmm. I, I took time and really uh, had a lot of fun making up pages and pages of rules and just trying to conceptualize everything. I painted up like a board which, um, you know, I don't recommend like going whole hog and like painting up an actual <laughs> board. Because of course, after a few play tests, that board needed to change. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it was just a really fun like escapist uh, hobby. And it's a lot about, you know, back in, back in the day, in the uh, like post Civil War era, 60s and 70s, you had all this like dribs and drabs of oil being found in the Western Pennsylvania mountains. Uh, and so you'd, you'd have crude oil coming out of the ground and all the major refining centers were in say like Cleveland or you know big urban centers. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the fun part as I was listening to this uh, biography about Rockefeller is thinking about uh, leveraging all the different railroads, which are mm -hmm. also being built and then monopolized and uh, you know, corporatized and things like that. At the same time, it's a very you know, rules-free business era in America. Yeah. Um, and you have to take your crude product, transport it, and then um, you know, uh, process it down into usable products and then distribute from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of like a really fun, I don't know, to me, yeah. <laughs> that's, that could be a fun idea for a board game. And so, yeah, yeah it's, see it. you've got all these like production centers, wells and things like that. They're um, that in the game, which has only been through two play tests. So uh, take it with, with many grains of salt, but it's, you know, you've got these very unpredictable wells. You don't know if they're gonna go bust or mm -hmm. I'm just, keep on booming you have to leverage your control of the different railroads and then um, you have to get it back to a processing plant mm. in like one of several urban areas and it gets it gets fun too when you think about like uh oil kind of going international mm -hmm. um things like that you know finding oil in different places like in russia and the middle east and things like that shipping it out via steamship all these all these fun things yeah so but like I said, the game has been through some play tests. It needed a lot of revamping after both of them. Um, so it hasn't been played to the end yet, mm. but um, some sort of weird mix of Ticket to Ride and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I don't know, Castles of Burgundy or something. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're managing all these different elements uh, would be the, the comparison, but it's it's kind of languishing downstairs currently <laughs> at other projects. It takes a lot of attention. But oh, for sure. That's really cool. Yeah. I still need to, I haven't played Ticket to Ride, but I've seen that it's on Board Game Arena. So maybe I will challenge Ooh, you to that. <laughs> we should do that. Yeah. yeah I, it's been a long time for me. <laughs> I'll, watch, I'll watch the YouTube on how to play it. And we'll try it out. I needed, I needed that for Marco Polo for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That sounds good. Uh, did you get into painting around that same time or have you been doing that for a while? I, yeah, so I took like art lessons um, starting when I was like five years old and that continued um, till eighth grade, I want to say. <laughs> so I, I had, a, had a long time there. Yeah, lots of stuff. Cool. And I, I like sketched and did a lot of that during high school. Uh -huh. And then I did zero art stuff during college. Um, I feel like there wasn't enough time. Mm -hmm. it, I need like, you know, I feel like it takes up some mental space and like time. Yeah. To really get into something and so it just didn't happen <laughs> um but yeah over uh as soon as as soon as i kind of figured out the ropes of the newspaper i started painting up some stuff and i you know i could take you on a tour of the house there's like little things hanging everywhere but oh, cool. i first started painting um there's a mountain we saw on our honeymoon after graduating um in massachusetts near uh, edith wharton's home place <laughs> so um, American author. And then, yeah, over the, uh, over the, like, the lockdowns and things, I worked on um, this one, actually. Um, so that was a, 
that was a quarantine painting nice. which is um if you can see it from here it's it's actually a cop both of these are copies of of, of paintings by uh one of my favorite artists who is edward hopper so mm. he painted uh night hawks which is the the scene of uh, a new york uh, it's not it's not a bar it's like a, it's a coffee coffee place mm -hmm. um late hours a lot of the city's closed down and there are just a few people sitting inside um but did a lot of uh landscapes and things like that and uh, around the new england area and i really really like him and so these are actually copies of uh, the paintings that he did cool. um i also did a portrait over the quarantine of mary Ellis as well which Ooh. um yeah, i like doing landscapes typically because i don't have to paint people which yeah, is people very hard. <laughs> um faces are are just really really challenging for me yeah. but anyway uh, i also completed a portrait of her like from one of her bridal photos turned into mm. kind of changed some things about it and turned it into a portrait as well That's cool. so yeah it's good yeah <laughs> i um I guess I used to love to draw and I was helping my parents. They, they just moved recently and I was helping them like go through my stuff and, and like I was finding all these drawings I did. But then I think I got like at that middle to high school time, I got embarrassed by it. I was like, oh, like I was doodling oh, no. at school or whatever. And I got really embarrassed. And so then I stopped. And then it, I actually did take an art class in college. I took a basic drawing class. And so I remember yeah. like, it was really fun going around campus that. and just sketching stuff and and then but then I was in sure. grad school and didn't have time and then now yeah. I'm kind of trying to get back into it a little <laughs> bit but uh that's awesome yeah what kind of what kind of stuff do you gravitate towards either stuff things that you draw or like in in music like if you've gone to art museums um the last few years yeah what, I haven't what do you really like? tried copying things per se which is it's actually yeah. a really good idea like I feel like that's <laughs> that's a good starting point I did I remember doing that like we had an assignment to do that in class but yeah I've oh, just okay. been kind of drawing or painting stuff I we recently went on a trip to Tahoe the other weekend and I tried just like painting the um the lake it was kind of but it like was watercolors and it kind of yeah. turned out kind of Sad, like as you mentioned when we were talking before it's like you have to it's not as forgiving <laughs> of a medium yeah i I've, I've tried it and i love this is acrylic paint and um you really can cover up a mistake in in a second now the biggest challenge with acrylic is just that it dries so fast so i i would recommend i would recommend acrylic um just because because it was a lot of fun and, and so is watercolor of course but mm -hmm. you can um I just feel like there's a lot, um, a lot that I can do, and a lot there's a lot you can add to acrylic to make it behave <laughs> like uh, like other paints too. Okay. So it's it's very flexible. Nice. Yeah, I'll yeah. have to try that. Just experiment. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, it's it's a really good hobby. It's just it just takes some like space and time to do. I feel like as well. Like I need to be in the right mind place, have some time on a weekend or something to to put toward it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so speaking of other hobbies, you're pretty into chess. How did you get into chess? Yeah, also also a lockdown thing. Lockdown um, but thing. initially, yeah, initially I um I played my mom. She taught me how to play mm. all during growing up. And I've still never beaten my mom <laughs> in a game of chess. Um she's very she she played in different chess clubs like one say in middle uh, school high school. Um so yeah, but I, I got into it. I, I downloaded the chess.com app, which, which is a fun one. There's, there's mm -hmm. a few to choose from. And um, they've got different lessons and things on there. So I was taking some of those and playing the computer and it became kind of a fun, like stress relief activity during the, a lot of the stress of the last winter. Yeah. Um, it was pretty easy to you know, sit myself down and play like a, a five or 10 minute game. Mm -hmm. And it takes up enough mental energy that, um, you really have to be invested in it and take your mind off other things. Sure. So that was, that was really, really fun. Um, I really appreciated that. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been five. I've invited lots of people to play. You're one of the few that has actually <laughs> said yes. Actually did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's been fun. Um, I, if, you know, if it makes you feel better, I got a great sense of how um, new to it I am as well. I went to a local chess club Oh. So people were rolling out tournament style uh -huh. mats and you know setting down chess clocks which i i typically haven't played with chess clocks so uh -huh. when we play we have several several hours and days to make a move which i like i yeah. like a, a very easygoing style of chess like right. that and so yeah 
put me on a timer though and it was it's pretty savage <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i could see that but that's good yeah. practice it is yeah it's it's a different it's a different way of thinking about the, the same game honestly so, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a lot of fun nice well another topic you, I, um, oh. oh no i was gonna ask if you have you um played anyone else recently or taken any lessons that you really enjoyed uh no, I kind of slowed down. I think I, I think I'm probably owe you a move. <laughs> so maybe, but <laughs> maybe we'll see. I did, I did actually. So my my younger cousins uh, have recently gotten little iPods, and on if you have like an uh, an iPad or some other Apple device or iPhone, mm -hmm. they have this little app that you can play like messages inside of the um, the messenger or like the texting app, and yeah. and. Uh, so my my cousin Hannah challenged me to a chess game, and I was really excited about that. I was wow. like, "Oh, good! She actually wants to play chess with me." So um, I'm actually playing her right now. <laughs> that is so awesome. Yeah, yeah, and like the we we played one other game before, and uh, I I guess I, I I she hasn't like I don't know if she's really been formally taught or not, but I I um it was a draw. Like <laughs> I couldn't beat her. Yeah. Like, I uh, I like actually took most of her pieces i think but i just could never actually checkmate her so i mean that that's what matters <laughs> that's the thing i struggle with too is is the end game yeah you know and there's just a few pieces left on the board how do you how do you wrap it all up and yeah sometimes sometimes not so good at that it's oh well i feel like that's the last for me at least that's going to be the last part of the game on master and I, I i imagine probably lots of people are that way too yeah because i mean you have your your opening moves, you learn those principles, and then mm -hmm. I, I can then like the middle and end is where I kind of start losing it. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah, so um, I was gonna another topic I'd written down was this that joke of ours that we had when we were in college that you're from the farm. <laughs> yeah, and um, I just wanted to you have such a strong stance on the correct way to say pecans and I'm saying it the way you want like you, you <laughs> say it should be said um but could you yeah. share with the audience like why it's right to say pecans and just some background on that <laughs> well yeah it's according to this like apocryphal story that <laughs> um so I I have no idea I haven't fact checked this it's just a story I heard a lot growing up uh -huh. but that there you know there are the two different ways to say that word you can say pecan you can say pecan and what I had always heard growing up is that, you know, um, 100 years ago, whenever, when people were selling pecans around in the South, uh, maybe in some of the border states as well, uh, people from the North typically said pecan. So a pecan was sort of became a term for a lesser pecan. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be sold up North. <laughs> And if you said pecan, you got you got the good stuff. The fresh one. I again, I don't know <laughs> if that's true or not, but I grew up hearing pecan and um, you know, yeah, story. So it's I, it's a fun it's a fun thing to share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I love that story, and yeah, I've told that story a few times, and yeah, I don't know if it's true either, but it's it's it kind of makes <laughs> sense. I could see it. Like, I just want to want to kind of fool those Yankees <laughs> with the, the moldy <laughs> yeah. pecans or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> something I don't know. that'll show them <laughs> yeah so no, yeah good. but you i know you're also pretty into like growing stuff so what what um what have you been growing lately um yeah well, we um so we just uh, in november we moved into our new home here in bristol uh bristol virginia and um when we did i'd say a few months after moving in we planted five blackberry vines out back so those gave us a little bit of fruit this year but it's the first year mm -hmm. um we also planted two blueberry bushes which need several years before they'll start getting big enough and producing and we started um three things from seed um in march that's typically like when our growing season indoors starts so we started a lot of tomatoes and a lot of peppers and some eggplants mm. and um transferred those out to a patch back in may and as of this week we've had um a vegetable from like at least one vegetable from each plant by this Ooh. point a lot of peppers we have a lot of green tomatoes and i'm 
you know, I, I did not do a good enough job of trimming up the tomato plants throughout the year. So you probably are going to have a lot of green tomatoes and maybe not too many <laughs> ripe tomatoes. <laughs> But yeah, you know, well, we can we can we can find something fun to do with those. And we're just now getting um, the eggplants to come in as well, which have taken the longest amount of time. But they they they're very nice now. They they're looking good. Exciting. And so we have yeah, it's a little like six by twelve plot. I got a lot of seed because you can if you go to like a Dollar Tree or a Dollar Store or anything like that, they sell like four for a dollar seed hmm. packs. And each pack has got like a hundred seeds in it. <laughs> so if you can start things from seed, it's a lot cheaper than buying like a three dollar plant yeah. singly so um that was our strategy we wanted to see if that would work and we've we've had a good time with it it's been just fun to see how i mean this whole the whole scope of the plant and something i didn't uh, i didn't really use any fertilizers or additives or anything like that so mm -hmm. it is 100 percent organic it's nice. just dirt and water dirt and, <laughs> and water. sunlight <laughs> um yeah and so I, I don't think we're getting as much, you know, as much produce as we would if we were using some of those things. And they're, they're good. There's, I mean, I don't have a, the strongest of stances on, on that uh, particular topic. But um, anyway, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, that sure. sounds like it. Yeah. I think we talked, were you, um, had y'all like looked at any herbs or anything like that? I have we some talking. mint plants. I haven't gotten anything yeah. new per se, but yeah, I've got some mint plants and uh, I always grow green onions. Like I save the little bottoms off the green onions and mm -hmm. grow those afterwards when we buy those them. Those are so good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, pretty tasty. Um, yeah, so recently we saw you when you came out to california you and your wife mary ellis you came out to california for a trip and i i remember you just talking about some of your like lockdown stories but you both survived and seemed super happy and you um at this point are kind of like at the point where like you've been married a good bit more longer than i have so i'd be curious to know about what what you say has um been kind of like your what is, what's made your marriage work? Like what are some of those uh, like kind of communication techniques or things that you've done to just, uh, you know, keep it going good? <laughs> yeah, I, that's that's really sweet of you to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, share, I shared that when um, you sent the questions over with Mary Ellison, just like, that, that's the sweetest thing. That's such a huge compliment. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I, I, I mean, the, the thing, you know, so we, we did talk about it, you know, briefly and I don't know the, the thing that occurred to both of us is just we've gotten to a really comfortable place with each other where we i feel like we can talk about literally anything together mm -hmm. and that that's made a huge difference um now i i don't know exactly how we got there <laughs> <laughs> and you know i mean obviously there's still things we, we disagree on and mm -hmm. everything but i don't know i i that it's uh that that has made the the biggest difference is just i really feel like um there's nothing we couldn't talk about and uh we can kind of go from there yeah um, i think that's huge having that trust and just com comfort with yeah. each other yeah ex exactly like you know i trust that you know we can we can talk about anything and that we can move forward from conversations to to you know meet each other's needs mm -hmm. and um you know, make a plan for the future there's those, those kind of things and that those things are going to ha happen as well so we'd like to say it's just I, I think we've gotten to know each other super super well and, and trust each other and and everything through that process totally yeah yeah super important and then yeah what's, um oh sorry i was gonna say like what's the <laughs> what's the last uh you know I am forgetting, but like eight, eight or nine months been like um, for you as well, because there's a lot of there's a lot of lockdown in there too. <laughs> oh yeah, it's just a lot of lot of change. Um, lockdown. We moved. We I have first yeah. year of marriage. Yeah, it was just a. But a there's I a lot going it was, on. I think it's good though, kind of like having sort of being forced. Like I think if you mm -hmm. are forced to be together, then it either works or it doesn't. And yeah, we've made it too. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I would kind of yeah second that. Like I, I do feel like I can pretty much talk to Borco, my husband, about anything, and mm -hmm. he um, isn't gonna like overreact or something, and uh, and listens. And 
it's, he's always very mature about these things. Like if, if yeah. I have some kind of, if I don't know if I'm stressed about something or just getting anx anxious about whatever, or, or like, I think that sometimes I've had a hard time just you know, I feel like there's some feelings I have that are like, these are silly, but he'll still listen. And I, that's what's really important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. At the end, you know, at the end of the day, and, and I'm sure you're the same way, you know, she's my best friend. Mm -hmm. And, and that's the, I think the most important dynamic of, of our relationship. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're life partners. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, just, just one, one more question is, um, what did you not expect about marriage before you got married? If, if anything, <laughs> I don't know. Um, cause it's been, it, it's been, um, we were, it was just our six month anniversary, you know, not even, not even a full six month year. ago. <laughs> yes. That, yes, exactly. <laughs> the thing I was setting myself up cause I was saying like, you know, it, we, we talk every year mm -hmm. about how it really doesn't feel like it's been four years, five uh -huh. years, six years. And I was like, well, you know, we never really think about time in years for, for lots of things. It's, yeah, it's yeah. not a very day-to-day -day, um, graspable amount of time. Mm. I, I always think like I get to new year's every year and I'm like so much happened in the last yeah. year. It's hard to put my head around it. Right. But if I, if I put it in terms of like weeks or months, then I was like, well, then it starts to make more sense to me. Cause I know what a mm -hmm. month feels like. And I know yeah. what a week feels like. <laughs> and so we're like, it's really just our 72 month anniversary. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and that felt like an appropriate amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that, that is still a pretty hefty uh, amount of time. And I don't know, like the, the, uh, so far as surprises go. Um, I guess, you know, it's, it's funny to think of it this way. I, I, I guess I thought um, before we were married that we would see, um, maybe see more of each other. Mm -hmm. than, we, than we than we did especially early on in the marriage because we, we were long distance practically until um mm -hmm. we did get married so definitely we've always seen each other more now being yeah. married than we did dating um but still like especially that first year i worked like a second shift type thing like three to mm -hmm. midnight out of the newspaper and she worked on a school schedule so we hardly yeah. ever saw each other except on our weekends um and to, to a certain extent that that's, you know, that's gotten a lot better, mm -hmm. but we, you know, there's been a lot of weird schedules with the newspaper and with grad school as well. Yeah. And so I haven't actually, you know, as I was looking forward to, to being married, I thought, yeah, we're going to see each other at the end of every day, like <laughs> five, <laughs> we're going to have all this time. Then we're going to have weekends. And of course, you know, that's, that hasn't exactly panned out because there's been other things we wanted to do and our things that our jobs have required of us, but mm -hmm. I don't know that's what comes to mind. It's, um, we, we get to see each other a lot and that's great. Uh, especially, especially now and over the past year. Yeah, I could see that. That, that makes sense. Especially yeah, with crazy different schedules. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It just didn't occur to me to think about it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm not good at conceptualizing time. That's, that's the moral of that story. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, <laughs> I, I just, I remember that when, when I was a kid, my mom used to measure time by like Teletubbies or Barney episodes. And I forgot which one was which, like one was 30 minutes and one was 15 minutes. And she'd be like, it's one more Teletubbies okay. episode until, or like two more <laughs> until we get there. <laughs> I, I'm going to put my neck out there and say the Teletubbies are shorter. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> I, yeah. yeah. Well, someone, someone can fact check me in the comments or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, this has been a lot of fun, Paul. It was great to catch up with you. And thanks for being uh, one of my early guinea pigs on this show. <laughs> Absolutely. It's great to talk and, you know, great to hang out in, in whatever format. <laughs>